Stephanie, excited to have you on the podcast. Thanks for joining. Happy to be here. Thanks for having yeah, me. I'm, I'm excited to talk about your journey because, and, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, but I tried to do a lot of research before the podcast and, you know, you said something around, you got bitten by the bug to be like an entrepreneur mm -hmm. when you were at LearnVest, which I'm assuming, and maybe you're similar to me and a lot of the folks where you didn't really think about starting businesses or you kind of took the traditional path. If that's correct, and maybe if it's not, tell me I'm wrong, but can you start me out? <laughs> like, tell me about, tell me about early Stephanie prior to that kind of aha moment, you know, back at LearnVest. Like, what what was life ab about for you? Is just the traditional path and starting a family, working a good job? Like, give me a little backdrop to that before we jump in deep. Yeah, I'll give you some color here. I don't think my background's entirely traditional, but you're right that it wasn't obvious to me that I was going to become a founder. Um, and actually, before I went to Learn Best and how I got introduced to Learn Best is that I was working um, in a financial advice company. Um, helping people enroll in their 401k plans, which is still a meaningful part of what I think about for my team at Orem and other people. Um, it's inevitable that we get older and we need money for that. And I started t tinkering around building some software, um, like a very simple thing that we were used to relying on in this company before LearnVest stopped coming, like the CD-ROM update stopped coming in the mail. And everyone's in a panic, what are we gonna do, right? This is like a bit of time ago. And I was like, oh, hey, I, I learned how to do this math on my calculator, like this time value of money thing. How much do I need for retirement? Like, that's a, just a math question. Why don't you give me $10,000 and I'll go hire somebody and I'll build it, having no idea what that actually meant. And so fast forward, I did actually end up building um, a piece of software for this company that I was working for. And it probably cost more than $10,000, but not a whole lot more. Um, and that's where I started to get interested in, like, there are things that exist, but you could make them better. And if you just roll up your sleeves, you know, in this case, I'm working a day job and I'm also parallel pathing, you know, doing a sort of offshore project with a developer in India who I'd met on the internet uh, and told him my idea. And he's like, you're going to have to send me wireframes. And I'm quickly Googling like, what are wireframes, right? I think that sometimes the inception of things that drive you to become an entrepreneur aren't totally obvious, but I do think they tend to start with similar characteristics, resourcefulness, curiosity a problem space where you feel like you can have an impact. And as the daughter of an immigrant, where I grew up in a household that, you know, often had to think about how to stretch a dollar further, I was always curious about whether or not there was a way to use technology to give amplified access to people so they could have the answers to their money questions. So it all kind of starts in that origin of just curiosity for me. And then fast forward, I um, ended up getting recruited to come in to learn best at a very, very early part of the company. And as a financial planner, was tasked with thinking about how do we take a girl blog for money, which is what the business was when I started, into something more. And so again, sort of tinkering, oh, I can build that in Excel before we have to commit engineering resources. Let me take a stab at it. Those were the kinds of things that inspired me to continue my journey and that ultimately led to what I'm doing today at Orem, where I'm thinking about payments infrastructure and what people can build in financial services on top of that infrastructure. Um, but certainly not, I think, a traditional path. And hopefully the path forward, whatever is ahead for us, also isn't traditional because I think the fun in all of this is being able to really be a consistent lifelong learner and be passionate about where you spend your time. And I've been able to kind of bring those two things together in everything that I've been able to work mm -hmm. on. Yeah, I, lo I love that lifelong learner, the curiosity you mentioned. Do you, mm -hmm. and, and really what you're sharing is entrepreneurship, I think is probably the language, right? Is And most folks that work at a company would, what would be the encouragement then based on that experience? Is that to try to take on new projects that maybe are outside your typical, um, you know, day, you know, in the life type stuff? Like what would you encourage folks that maybe don't have that bug yet, or maybe they may never get it, but at least to try and see, how, how would you encourage them to go about that? Well, I think in today's world, you know, sometimes this is easier said than done, but like sit at the table, listen, you don't necessarily have to have a voice, but if you're invited to a meeting, and it makes sense to learn something, go listen. If you're shoulder tapped to do something that sounds wild and crazy, give consideration to saying yes, because those are where the opportunities tend to lie. And I find that, you know, it there's like your heads down work, there's what you need to deliver by end of day. And then there's putting yourself in a position to hear 
directly and indirectly from customers, from other business leaders about problems that are hard to solve. And I think that's where the spark for me always comes from is listening to like, well, rather than saying we can't do something or that's a blocker, what can we do to unblock it? How might we, right? I use that phrase a lot. In fact, right before we started our recording today, I was chatting with one of our executives asking this question, how might we, how do we turn this around? Because right now it feels like a blocker and I want to make it something that we could possibly put, um, you know, some energy into. So I think it's really just, again, listening, putting yourself in a position where you've got a willingness and people know, hey, you're kind of up for anything, no job too small. Um, one of the first things that I had to do when I joined LearnVest, in fact, probably I think I was given the assignment like before my first day, was to find a compliant phone system that we could use to give financial advice over the phone, obviously, that could record things, but could also be deleted, but wouldn't cost us a lot of money. And like, I'm a financial planner at this point in my life. You know, maybe I've tinkered enough in Excel to do some cool things, but I absolutely don't know anything about compliance and registered investment advisor requirements and phone systems. But there's this good friend called Google. And now, of course, there's ChatGPT and even smarter versions of self-serving your ability to learn how to do something. And I think just repeating that behavior, right? If asked to do something, ask questions, get clarity on what is expected, and be able to push boundaries a little bit um, and, and believe in yourself, which is easier said than done, to be honest. I think we all perhaps not all, but many of us do struggle with a fair bit of imposter syndrome. And I talk a lot about that. Um, who, me? You think I'm going to do that? I'm capable? You're, you're talking to me? But the reality is like nearly everyone is capable and just a matter of applying your thinking, your curiosity um, in all the right ways. And I think just staying open-minded. Do you think a lot of that was upbringing? Like it seemed like your parents maybe had an influence on you to try things, even though the imposter syndrome may be there. Do you, do you find that is this 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 has come up actually in a lot of recent podcasts of like is the, is there some innate ability that some folks have that kind of take the reins and go with it or is this something that's developed over time just being in the right environments and around the right people I'm kind of curious how you think about it I think there's some component of nature that definitely sparks your kind of way of thinking but I would say like very much there's a nurture component and that you know you can draw this out in lots of people. What probably is the like, will it work or won't it work deciding factor is what's your risk tolerance? How much does failure scare you? Because inevitably, in many of the things I've endeavored to do, I've not gotten it right the first or second or even third time I've tried it. But being curious and being willing to kind of continue to try. So I think resilience alongside resourcefulness is really a, you know, a key variable, at least for me. And I do think that a lot of times our fear of being wrong, our fear of saying the wrong thing prevents us from projecting an idea or making a statement or carrying something forward, even though we think in our heads, a great idea. And so figuring out ways to break down all those fears and to break down the concern that like failure will destroy you because it certainly won't, right? Failure actually gives you tons of tidbits of learnings. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt sometimes to scrape your elbows or skin your knees or like make a mistake that's fairly public, which I've done as a founder and I've done many times before being a founder, but it's the get back up and what did I learn and how do I not make that same mistake twice aspect that I think is really coachable. Um, and then coupling that with sort of the belief that like, I sort of say, you know, anything's possible, right? You think of all these things that seemed incredibly hard to build and yet they exist today if we could imagine possibility what's on the other side how do we think about opportunities and i think just coming with that sort of open-minded framework tends to be really helpful um and i do think most people have the ability to go into this category of entrepreneur um but to do it well i think it also comes with a support system uh talking to friends and family taking care of your mental health taking care of your physical health. So it's not just like all in on something. It's also having, you know, in my case, a very supportive and thoughtful husband who's like encouraging that I try again, having great friends who think about, you know, the upside and what you're doing. Um, and so it's not just purely, I think, up to the individual, but it's also a bit about how you build that support me mechanism around yourself when you're endeavoring to take whatever nature has given you. Yeah and nurture whatever you're interested in. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, and one thing on top of that, you talk about the risk tolerance, I think 
I think it's also understand that you don't have to do it tomorrow, like all in that you think, you know, I'm going to build a billion dollar right. business tomorrow. Well, why don't right. you just try to see if you can work a couple hours this week outside of your normal job and see if you even like what the idea you have. And I think that's where a lot of folks I talk with, they get stuck is like, they don't even start the process of trying to see if it's something they like. It's kind of like all or nothing. And I think there's such a middle ground of like, let's just try it. Would you agree with that? Of like that prototyping and tinkering to even go before? The Absolutely. Point? Absolutely. And I think what sometimes happens is folks will have an idea. They'll get as far as like, I'm going to tinker. And then they'll show it to someone, an investor, a friend, who knows, a colleague. And that person will be like, oh, that's never going to work. And all of a sudden they retreat mm -hmm. back inside. You're right. It won't work. Put it back on the shelf. I can't even tell you the number of times people have said, oh, that can't work, right? At LearnVest, we built a category creating financial planning company. Financial advice on the internet definitely wasn't a thing you just went out and bought, but we made it viable. And today at Aurum, as the simplest API for fast, reliable payments and instant bank account verification, we've again faced the hurdle of working through all the unknowns of faster payments and people saying like, we're never gonna retire our old payment system. So why even try, right? And it is easy to hear that and think, oh gosh, let me just revert back to something safe. And the reality is I think creating space to tinker allows you to be expansive in your thinking. And you do have, you're not gonna have as many believers as you have naysayers. What I try to listen for if somebody says, that's not a great idea or here's what I don't think works is like, why not? What am I missing? Market size, technical answers. Like, what did you see that I didn't see as opposed to just shutting down? And so I think, again, having the ability to think about pushing yourself a little bit um, into an area that's often uncomfortable to try to figure out what is it that I'm really hearing? Am I hearing that I'm fundamentally wrong about what I'm tinkering with? Or am I hearing that there's some tweaks I could make and then it would be on the right path. And how many people should I talk to about that idea and just continuing to build forward? So yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. Well, and you know, do you bring up the support systems? I mean, sometimes they're good. And sometimes, you know, if it's like mom says, don't do this because she doesn't want you to take the leap, that might not be the best advice either. Like there's, there might be a reason behind the don't do it, right? So I think it's also the context of like who you actually are asking the insight and where it's coming from, I would, I would think, right? Yeah, I think there's a lens to filter for sure. I remember when I was interviewing actually at LearnVest, thinking about taking the role. I lived in Southern California, LearnVest headquartered in New York. These feel like a mismatch, right? And ultimately over a period of time, we agreed that it would work and I could work for the company and work remotely, which let's go back to like 2011 or whenever this was close to then. That wasn't common like it is today in 2024. And it certainly wasn't, we didn't have the tools even that we have now. And I remember actually speaking of parents, both of my parents being like, you're going to be lonely. You're not going to have any colleagues that you can connect with. Here's all the reasons why not to do it. And I was like, those are, those are good inputs because I probably will be lonely and it will feel strange to get up at five in the morning when no one else in my local life is doing that. But here's why I think it's worth it. I'm going to give it a try and I'm going to plan for those things. And it ended up that I relocated to New York. So after a period of time, the pull to be closer to the heartbeat of the company was really high and it was 100% worth it. But if I'd listened to that one input, I definitely would be doing something different today. And so you're right, the filtering and the thinking about it. What I find is very challenging is there's what other people want you to do. And that can have a massive influence on how you decide what you want to do. If you can separate the two, most of the time I'm happiest when I've chosen something that aligns with my values and what I want to do, using some of that input to guide and maybe make decisions in the margins um, but if I'd followed what everyone else wanted me to do or what people thought I was good at, again, I definitely wouldn't be sitting in an entrepreneur seat today. I'd probably be doing something completely different. And I like the path I'm on. And I, I, I'm really proud of the ability to kind of take those inputs, but also push through and stay true to who I really am. Well, let's talk about that idea a little bit. We, we've said the word idea a few times. I want to go back because I, if I recall, you noodled on this idea for Orm for a little while. So get, what's the inception period? Like what, do you remember like the day or, or year of like when this idea hit you and then when you actually took like some action to execute on it? I do. So when I think about Orem, again, we're the simplest API for fast, reliable payments. 
which to most people is like, what? That basically means we're like Amazon, right? Amazon gets your package anytime you want it, be it FedEx, UPS, Postal Service, their Blue Vans, you don't care how, you care that it's fast and reliable. Well, that's what we do for moving money in the US. Um, ACH, RTP, FedNow, wires, it's all orchestrated, right? The reason I got interested in infrastructure is because when I was delivering financial advice for a living, both in the early software days and then at LearnVest, and then post-acquisition, we sold LearnVest to Northwestern Mutual, six nine million Americans get financial advice from Northwestern Mutual on this amazing software experience we built. And a good number of them, even people with means, don't want to do something like save in a high yield savings, which right now is paying my Betterment accounts paying 5%, right? Of course, it's worth it to do that. But for a lot of people, it wasn't worth it because the fear that you couldn't get your money back mm -hmm. at night, on the weekends, on a holiday felt very high. So people leave trillions of dollars sitting idle in cash, mm -hmm. checking yep. accounts when they could be earning yield in a brokerage account, in a crypto wallet, in a, right? No, this is not investment advice. But, you know, broadly speaking, that was originally categorized as a behavior problem. And my theory, which is still my thinking, is that it's a flaw in the financial system. Why is it that I can only get a few hundred dollars of my own money from an ATM when the bank's not open on a Saturday? Why can't I get all of it? Why can't I move it instantly from this bank to this financial institution to get a better financial result for myself? Like what's blocking that? And so the aha wasn't so much I should build payments infrastructure as it was peeling back the layers of this problem space and wondering, well, if it's not behavior change that we're going to try to focus on, because I don't think that's going to get us very far, convincing you why you should do something, then what else is there? Well, if in my life I could easily move my money seamlessly 24-7, 365 between any financial vehicle, I'd be a lot more inclined to put it somewhere that's good for me, knowing that if I had an emergency, I could get it back. Well, let's go look at how money moves. Oh, it's the system that's old and outdated and matches a different era. And there's a new system, but no one's using the new system. How do we bring these two worlds together? Because there's times in which you want money to move a little slower. There's risk in you know, managing money that moves instantly. And you want the controls of reversibility and things that ACH offers. There's also times in which money moving instantly is magic. And not only instantly, but at night and on the holidays and on weekends when the banks are closed. So that's when they started to develop an interest in saying, well, if the underlying infrastructure that covers 70 now $5 trillion of money moved between bank accounts is doing it without being able to modernize. There's got to be a technology answer that bridges that gap. And that's how the aha came for what ultimately today is Orem. Oh, wow. Well, that sounds interesting. I don't, you know, half of what you said, I'm like, <laughs> okay, I get it. You know, I know enough about, I guess, moving money a little bit, but how, so one, I guess that how do you start that actually go from that idea to how am I going to turn this into something? Because a lot of ideas, you know, there's an elephant graveyard of just ideas sitting out there that no one executed on. So let's start there first. And I have a few more questions of the process, but like, how did you take the first step or two? Like, how did you actually get it out of the, you know, out of home plate and down to the first baseline? Well, this book recommendation certainly isn't novel or new, but it is useful. So I, I highly recommend folks read Lean Startup if you've never read it or you want to reread it. It's useful because it really focuses on a very minimally viable MVP version of something that can help you test and learn quickly and iterate quickly. And in the world of software development, you know, I had the luxury of learning. There were two approaches take five years, build everything, build it perfectly, launch it, and it's five years out of date, which isn't great. Or build it in very small pieces, ship imperfect but workable versions of whatever you're working on, and continue to perfect it. Now, in payments, it's a little bit harder to do that. In a consumer product, it's a little bit easier because consumers are willing to accept more narrow solutions or services. The margin for failure in a payments business is zero, right? So we did have to spend more time initially thinking about how to stand up the infrastructure. So what I did is I sort of zoomed out and said, what's minimally viable? Where do we start? And what we decided to start with, which is controversial, was an instant payment, an RTP. Mm. Now, at the time that we were raising capital and getting started with our build, instant payments was heard of. The clearinghouse had launched RTP. The Fed had not yet launched FedNow. 
And Europe and other countries had done faster payments, but the US, this was like brand new. So the number of people that would buy instant payments was very small. But we found a couple of use cases where time to money really mattered to the end recipient of the payment. And we said, before we launch anything else, let's launch this narrow thing and prove value around time to money. Does it matter that you can get money faster, that you can get money instantly, that you can get money around the clock? The answer was yes. And then we tacked on other forms of payments. And now we have a fully orchestrated API that can handle any type of bank transfer that you want to do in the US at any time of day for any amount of money. But the first version of that was narrow. And it required thinking through a financial partner because Forum's not a bank. We don't want to be a bank. We want to work with financial partners. And it required thinking through a minimally viable version of building this. That meant we had an API, but we didn't have a portal or a front end. You couldn't log in and see a whole lot of things. So we couldn't take it longer, built more things and shipped it later, but we would then be behind schedule on hearing customer feedback. And customer feedback is kind of the heartbeat of being able to know what to do next, right? right? There's some gut instinct in that too. So it's not like it's 100% clear customer said, do it, do it. But I find that, you know, when you take a giant problem and you break it down in small iterative pieces and you have engineering software teams break it down into even smaller pieces, eventually lines of code add up to building a complete package and you have something that you can ship and test and learn and probably throw away because the first couple of things you build weren't exactly what the customer needed or didn't work in the way you thought they would. Um, and keep going, right? Build on from there and keep listening and learning. And I think if, if you can take that approach in any industry with any problem, you can be an entrepreneur. Were you still at LearnVest at the time when you kind of started to put this idea together or did, had you had left there and then, and then branched out to do this? The idea started percolating while I was at LearnVest and in the post acquisition years with Northwestern Mutual, because I just kept seeing the problem. And I'm like, this is strange and frustrating. Um, and I actually ended up doing a tour of duty outside of FinTech for um, about two years working uh, for SoulCycle in the fitness category, which gave me time to zoom out and think about the problem. And just it just wouldn't go away. I was like, this is such a weird thing that I just, I keep thinking about it. I keep pondering it. I keep seeing it in my own life. I'm trying to transfer money so I can invest it or I have a you know mortgage that needs to close. And like, I'm trying to wire funds. It's just not working. And I kept hearing these same problems from other people. And so at a certain point, I started to think, wow, this, this really isn't going away. Maybe that's a sign that I should think about it more seriously. And so I started talking to some investor friends. What do you think? Is this, you know, is this a big idea, a small idea? How do you see it in the you know, landscape of things? And that ultimately led me to take the first leap of faith, which was to quit my job. Yeah. Because I do think, although there's like, you know, tinkering on the side and getting, you know, your, your, your thoughts together, I do think you really have to be as an entrepreneur fully focused. Mm -hmm. I know there are some folks that can probably, you know, be all in on more than one thing, but I can't. I, I really am all in on the thing I'm working on and I have a really high work ethic. So I wanted to make sure I was able to put the full focus into what I was going to be building. And so I quit my job with the understanding with my husband and my family that that was going to mean I was going to start a company and it was going to come with different work hours and at the time, no paycheck and, you know, a variety of changes. So those are, I think, some adjustments to be thinking about too. It's not just how do I launch something, but how do I fund my ability to take time away from, you know, a salaried role, which is what has paid the bill so far and have the ability to go raise capital and ultimately build a company. And so, so I did it. So I quit my job and I had no team no money in the bank and no like investor checks. Right. And, and, I, and then I was like, I was like alone all by myself. And you're always on a team, right? No matter what, you always have somebody else, a boss, a team. And all of a sudden I was alone. And I think that's when perhaps a lot of people go, Oh shoot, back up a second. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this because it can be a pretty isolating and daunting experience. But I think it's also passion that drives us as entrepreneurs and I was like, blank piece of paper. What do I need to write down today? Mm. What do I need to get done? Who do I need to call? And eventually that led to making my first hire. And he's still with the company five years later. Um, and, you know, just starting to like slowly plot the decisions that were going to come, the relationships we need to build. And ultimately, 
the capital we need to raise to power the business that we have today. So I want to, I want to needle into that a little bit. So you leave the job. Now, what was, I, I, I had Mike Lewis on who wrote this book, when to jump. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. read the, the book, but you know, I, I love this kind of building the runway and this kind of idea to make that jump. Did you, and maybe obviously your husband was probably involved, have that plan of attack of like, Hey, I'm planning on leaving at this time. Or was it kind of more of a gut? Like I got to go like, I mean, in my case, it was a confluence of events. The work that I was doing was completing. Okay. And the thing I came to incubate um, at SoulCycle was launching and doing well. I thought it was in a good place where I could package it up and give it to a new leader so they could take it forward. Um, and I think that's important, right? Like, I want to finish what I start. And I felt like the thing I wanted to see through was, was getting to completion. And then for me as a financial planner, I always go back to financial readiness, you know, how are we going to manage on a single paycheck and we have a mortgage and we have two kids and we have college savings and you know, all the things like how do we make a smart choice and how do I do it in a way that allows me to lean in with a dip, like I said, a different kind of schedule. Um, and so I did have some sense of what you might call runway planning, right? Which is like, I think I want to do this. I'm getting ready to wrap up something. I'm going to do the next thing. But there was kind of a, a period in between where I was starting to transition and hadn't totally um, decided that I was going to go raise capital. Um, and so I took a period of time to like analyze the market, pull my thoughts together, get some subject matter experts around me, build up the thesis and a business plan. And then I went and raised institutional capital. Now, in my story, all that sounds like, you know, pretty smooth sailing. And it was mostly, but... I did this at the end of 2019, coming into early 2020, and then the pandemic hit. And so now I have no money in the bank, and now I have to go fundraise in an environment in which everything's upside down. So there were definitely some unknowns in those early weeks, months of thinking about whether or not even raising capital was viable, uh, because the whole venture market was kind of standing still, just like the whole world was trying to figure out, is this two weeks? of pandemic or is this going to be something longer and more substantial and what does it mean for the markets and for businesses and for everything else? So certainly some wild stories in there, uh, but you know, we successfully raised around in May of 2020 and that put us on a path to hire a small team, ship our first lines of code and ultimately get to our first customers quickly thereafter. Looking back, and, and of course, we you know you mentioned the failure is part of the journey. I mean, you, you may not change anything mm -hmm. because you are where you are today. Um, but if someone's in that position of like, hey, I have this idea, I'm thinking of starting, I, I, maybe I want to leave my job, I'm not sure. What, it, what did you learn from that experience of doing that, that you would either say, hey, from my experience, I would encourage you to do X, or eh, I would encourage you to take a different path that might be a little bit better for you. Anything you'd share on that, that starting phase back in what, 2018, 2019? You know, it's interesting because, again, I come back to like the archetype, like what makes an entrepreneur and as we said earlier, there's the you know potential founder DNA that you're born with, and then there's the nurturing of the environments you've been around and what you learn from that. And I think what ultimately I see people struggling with, and I've, I taught, I, I have the great fortune of doing some angel investing and just working with other entrepreneurs, I see people struggle with the cliff when suddenly there isn't a boss or a team, you're alone, and you have to manifest destiny. You now have to take a blank piece of paper and get all the ideas that you've been thinking about and turn them into something that's real. And you're often in the beginning alone. Some people have a co-founder, but you're often alone. And in my case, I was not only alone, I happened to also be a non-technical founder, which is for me a big part of the imposter syndrome that's always a challenge. So I wouldn't change anything, at least from the very, very beginning. There's certainly some decisions I'd like to redo uh, later, but I would say that the Questions to ask yourself have a lot to do with what do you get energy from? How self-motivated are you? Do you need an office or can you work from home and realistically like separate from distractions? And if you completed a day, five days, a week, a month, how would you know that you were making progress? What would you be expecting progress looks like? And I think unless you do some of those exercises up front, you can run the risk of running into sort of that vacuum of uncertainty. 
and almost too much decision making haunting you to know what decision to make today versus tomorrow. And just asking yourself questions again about risk, about ambiguity, about failure. And, and I think critically, how will I support myself on this journey? How will I take care of, like I said, my mental health? Can I get a coach from the beginning to help me work through the growth of being a founder? You know, there's things you can do, um, but just quitting your job on a whim, I think it's risky because as you said already, and as I will say, like I'm five years in and we're by no means yet, you know, a billion dollar revenue company, but we will be, but it will be a decade. And that's probably true about most tech companies is that it's 10 years not two. And anything that feels instant, like, oh, I just started hearing about that company. Wow, look how successful they are. You'll probably find that they've been around five, six, seven, eight years by the time you're like, wow. And there's a lot that happens in the beginning where it's pure willpower and grit and resilience that's required. And it's such a long, I think, longer process than anyone understands it is till they're in it. Um, And those are the kinds of things I think help with the reflection on taking a leap of faith. Yeah. I really like that cliff analogy. Uh, (laughs) You don't want to fall off that, but no, I, but it goes back to what we were talking about. Like, I think is asking yourself those questions and maybe you talk about the the risk earlier. It de-risks it because you've already, I I think that's where, you know, I, I I talk on this on another path of like from the mental health side and, and helping people get started, not from a business side even, but just again, how do I improve my life, be more fulfilled? It's, I think, the unwillingness to actually sit with ourselves and listen to what we want or what we don't want and being settled. We're so like distracted. We got the phone, we got all this stuff over, but how, you know, just go take a 20 minute walk and just let nature kind of help you, right? Do you do anything like that? And from like the mental health side, the mindset to help you kind of stay centered because you have this craziness of a billion dollar business that you want to build? Absolutely. I have so many of those things. Hopefully they're useful for folks who are listening. Some probably won't surprise you. Um, uh, I Number one, probably my like biggest thing I prioritize is sleep. Yeah. So that means I want eight hours, ideally. Most of the time I can achieve that, not all the time. Sometimes I have to catch up you know, on the weekends from travel or red-eye flights that I swear I'm too old to take, but keep taking because uh, there's no time machine between San Francisco and New York, although there should be. Um, so sleep is a really big priority for me. And um, just I wear a whoop. I'm obsessed with the data that it provides about sort of where my, you know, wellness is in general. And I would say like recovery overall or ability to perform. And that helps then put me in a position where I can be at my best when I'm tired. I'm not at my best. Right. right. So I try not to be tired. Uh, means sometimes foregoing, you know, industry events or dinners or travel And so again, I think there can be a kind of culture and founders and entrepreneurs of fear of missing out because, you know, so-and-so is holding a conference or an event or a happy hour and you're not there. I just, I put this as my like really big personal North Star. And then I follow that with the ability to move, right? Movement's really important to me. I love to run. I love yoga. I love being outside. And, you know, to your point, like a walk can be the most freeing thing to just zone out and realize a big aha, like see something that wasn't obvious if you were just cranking away on Zoom or on email all day. Um, And then I really, listen, I will work around the clock. I grew up in hustle culture. I also think hustle culture is dying a little bit from the perspective of how it degrades your mental health. And I've done my fair share of all-nighters. I will do my fair share of all-nighters in the future. That's always part of this journey. But I try to really be present for my family and for my kids and I try not to pass on substantial amounts of work or busy work to the team at night and on the weekends, because I do think being a whole person and taking time to recover and do our best work is better than just working all the time for working sake. I do think there's windows of time in which you're like, we're in a sprint and for a couple of weeks, it's going to be intense. And our team always pulls together at Orem for those moments. And it, it always makes me proud. And there's a time to say like, take a vacation take time off, rest, relax, and like take care of yourself because burnout would destroy all the power and passion that's living inside of all of us entrepreneurs to build big things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, you know, it's kind of a delicate thing and, and, and sort of hard to thread the needle sometimes when the demands 
are high and investors have big expectations. You don't want to let anyone down. Um, so those things come to mind. And the last thing is that's super important to me is I work with a coach. I work with somebody who's a startup coach specifically, um, who only works with founders and operators who are in venture backed companies or building their own businesses. And if I could change one thing about the beginning, I would have found a coach earlier. Oh, okay. Um, we started working together a number of years into the journey. And I think I would have developed faster as a founder and CEO managed better in all regards and cultivated better decision-making criteria for the myriad decisions you have to make in a, a more aligned way than just like bumping around in the dark, which is what I did for the first couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Coaching, uh, absolutely important. If you can find, even, even if you, you know, some people can't afford a coach or maybe can't find even a mentor, someone that you can lean on, I think a little bit to give some outside perspective. Uh, you mentioned something that's really interesting, actually, I think is important is, is kind of this, what you try to do from your family and try to, you know, from the uh, health and wellness and all that, you know, you start out as a founder alone, but when you build this company, like it's really built on your, like how you live, because if, yeah, if you're sending text messages, as a team at, you know, 6 PM on a Saturday night and expecting them to respond, that's going to bleed over to the culture not a good thing, I don't think, you know, but if you're saying, Hey, we're doing, you know, this, that, and the other two, I want you to work hard when you're here, but go, go take time. If your kid's graduating from high school, take the day off. Like, you go be there. there. Yeah, so absolutely. How, yeah. I, I guess I mean, maybe this is a good transition. Like how did you think about like, Oh shit, I got to actually build a team. It's not just me. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you think about going into that? I think in this case, being a little bit older and having kids already probably changed the profile of how I showed up. And there was a time in my life when I could work seven days a week. And I suppose I still could, but then who would raise my children? <laughs> right. Um, and so I think there's some just aspects of like age and time. And I, you know, I became a founder later than a lot of founders, which actually in itself is sometimes isolating. Like lots of people are like 25. I'm in my forties. Um, but hopefully that just means I have wisdom right, right. that has accumulated, right? right? Um, and I, I do think like just really consciously, I thought about like work environments where I loved working and work environments where I worked, but it was stressful and trying to pick my way through like what was the characteristics of what made great teams and great work. And in today's technology world, there are so many ways to be able to optimize when you want to work versus when others want to work. For example, sometimes... I have a morning to myself and I just have stuff I want to clear off my plate and I'm going to get in my inbox and go through Slack, but I can schedule everything to go out Monday morning. So unless it's absolutely essential, even if I send you an email and it says like, not urgent, if the CEO sends an email on Saturday, you're going to reply. Mm -hmm. So I just try not to do that. It doesn't mean I don't think about those things or get stuff done. But I try to think about the mechanisms for like, when is this information relevant to the other party? Am I blocking anyone? If I schedule it for Monday, the answer is no. Then like, let's just move it so that I get my plate cleared when I feel like it, but I'm not putting other work mm -hmm. on other people at a time, which doesn't make sense. When we run a remote company as a result of the pandemic. Um, it's been largely a really great experience. There's times in which, of course, we wish we could just snap our fingers and pull everyone together and... Uh, we, we do sometimes get together as a team, but in a remote world, we also have to think about what time zone is it? My 9 p.m. when my kids go to sleep and I'm like catching back up is somebody else's dinner time. And I had the privilege of having dinner offline. So like, I don't want to be able, I don't want to have people not be able to have that same opportunity just because they live in a different time zone. So we've created a philosophy at Orem about remote work and specifically about communications and we're a synchronous company, even though we're remote. So people overlap on specific hours, which then ensures a little bit more predictability about when we need you, what needs to get done, when you're expected to work, and what is off hours. If we need you for an incident or an urgent issue, we know how to call on people and get them, you know, sort of on Slack or online or whatever the case may be. Um, but I do think it's really important, and it does start at the top. I can say words like, you know, take time and take PTO. If I go on vacation and all I do is work, right. the team sees that, right? right? And so I, I, did, I have my fair share of times where I'm out of office and checking in, but I also have my fair share of times where I'm truly taking a break. And I think that's good for me and it's good for the company. 
It also allows others to step up. When I'm not there, there are proxies for the things I do. And those people get to take on higher level experiences and get more exposure and do things that grow their careers as well. And I, so I think it's, it's sort of net benefit to everybody. Um, yeah. When we structure it like this. Yeah, I love that. Well, and it, it goes back to like a level of trust that you're building as well. Like, hey, you can take on this role. I believe in you. Like, go try it versus the micromanagey stuff of, you know, kind of making sure, hey, are you are you doing this one little thing? It's like, dude, just let people be human and, you know, be adults. I think if you get out of the way, most people will do good work. It's the, the managers. Right. And I've had a lot of these. Maybe you have of like very in your face. Like, did you check this one box? And it's like, that's not motivating work at all. I don't know right. why people do that. I mean, I know why people do it. I don't know why though they do it. <laughs> I think people do that because they're worried about themselves. Yeah. And, you know, I learned a long time ago, in particular being married, if you want something done, you can get lots of people to get something done if the outcome is what you care about. If you want it done the way you want it done, you better do it yourself. And I think that's where managers can get mixed up, which is cultivating employees' abilities to do great work doesn't mean they should do it the way you would have done it. And maybe they will do it similar to how you would have done it, um, but they might arrive at as good of or even better an outcome or output if they know what the destination is and they have to figure out the journey and you're there to guide that versus, to your point, telling you step by step. Now, at some entry level rules, a little more step by step guidance is necessary, but I sort of go back to the philosophy. It's a revolving door decision. 99% of things can be decided again, changed later, fixed and made better. And I try to think about, you know, in the interest of time, let's make decisions where maybe we're only 80% certain and we don't have the remaining 20% of information we'd really like to have. But as a CEO, making decisions fast and moving on is more important than being right all the time. And that is something that I trend, I really think about and I try to pass on to others as we think about like just keep moving, keep going. And if we need to iterate on a vendor we've chosen or a software decision or any number of things, 99% of that we can do again later. And we should just get to the first decision now. You know, there's a lot of threads here. We won't have time to go into parenting, but like, there's a lot of threads, <laughs> but like, I think, I don't know how old your kids are. I have a 12 year old, but like trying to get him, I, this was, took me the longest time to say, Hey bud, I'm, you know, whatever it is. Like I actually got him to start cleaning his bathroom now, which is the most amazing thing ever. Oh, wow. I know oh, wow. like even doing the dishes or whatever, but it's like, I, I had to let the ego aside and say, Hey bud, if you're going to, you do it. And I had to step away and be like, it doesn't matter how he does it. It's that he is right. actually doing the, the action. Yes. And eventually we can coach him and do whatever. But it, I think that's the yes. biggest thing. Cause it's a parallel to parenting where a lot of times it's like, do this and that it's never good enough. It's like, no, no, let him do it how he wants to do it. I don't know if you think about that with parenting as well, but. All of the time. I will admit though, the one thing that I always have to control is how the dishwasher gets loaded. That's my like weak spot, <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. And you know, kids grow up to become people who join teams, who become leaders, who become, and so like the earlier we can cultivate the sense of like, it doesn't have to be perfect. And there's ways to make it incrementally better and like just do it and try it. I think it's one of those things that probably I was innately exposed to and didn't even realize that allowed me to develop some of my sense of certainty and surety that like I could figure stuff out. And sometimes that like, how am I going to figure it out moment, whether it's kids or it's adults in the work life, that's actually where a lot of the magic comes from. Being told what to do means you don't get a whole heck of a lot of creativity. Being asked to give an outcome and figure out how to, you're going to do that. That's where I think we unlock human potential. Oh uh, Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Well, so it's been an awesome conversation. Let's end on this. I'm curious your thoughts. Um, you know, I used to ask a lot and I still do from time to time, like, Hey, what's your best advice? Someone getting started. What I find more fun now is for you to pose a question or a challenge, something that where someone can have, they have to take action to get started. They can't just ruminate. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious at throwing that back to you. Like, is there, is there a question and a, a, a challenge for people that are in this kind of, I don't know if I want to start, I have this idea. How would you encourage them to get started and kind of go on the new? Path? Would you be willing to send a survey to a hundred people in your network and ask them to fill it out to validate some aspect of the experience you want to build? If the answer is no, you wouldn't go to your friends, your network, your colleagues, then I think you should go back and reevaluate. 
Wow. Okay. I like that. What would you, what would you put in the survey? <laughs> Just like a question, a, a few questions, like what, what would be like one question you'd put in? Well, it depends on what you're thinking about building, but I think putting yourself out there to bravely say, I'm going to build a company. I'm looking for input on these three things. Um, and I need five more people from your network to help me fill it out. Can you pass it on? What that does, I think it demonstrates kind of the key things about an entrepreneur asking for help, being vulnerable, taking customer feedback, and asking other people to pay it forward so you can get to people you can't access. Because most, most things are about network effects and or about distribution. Because as an entrepreneur and ultimately a founder and CEO, you have to do those things all the time. You have to grovel, you have to beg, you have to ask for things. They don't just fall out of the blue sky. And if it makes you nervous to think about sharing with others the idea you have, taking the risk to hear their feedback and or asking people to help you, I think those are signals that would make you want to stop and think about, are you ready to, to found something or start a company? And, and, and if those things scare you, what would you do to get ready? Mm. I think becomes the prompt. I love that. That's a, that's a great way to end this and, and a great challenge for folks to take. Uh, so I mean, where, do you spend anywhere online? Where can people say hello to you? Come find me on LinkedIn or check us out at orum.io. We'd love to chat. Awesome. Steffi, thank you so much for being on. This was a pleasure. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks.